seat go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. They have to stand and they will stare at you. <laughs> I just want to share a, a, a model that we're beginning to explore in Philadelphia okay. with at-risk developers who are typically would, uh, in the extractive model, displace uh, disenfranchised communities buy their homes for $50,000 when they're really worth $400,000 mm -hmm. because that cash is more than they've seen in a long time, but they're left with nothing. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is doing, a, it's not a community land trust, but it's an mm -hmm. aggregation of properties where the, the vacant homes or the demolished homes are actually available for the developer to do market rate housing uh -huh. without displacing anybody in the neighborhood. And then we use urban agriculture, power, and water as utilities that pay for the costs of those people to stay there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the numbers begin to pencil out from a purely um, uh, extractive, I hate to use that word, but you know, profit motive mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. to allow um, uh, those community members to actually receive the value of their property. Not the most enlightened model, but it's a different model. I just yeah. want to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And please, this is yeah. dynamic. If there are other people, just I, I appreciate in, tap someone on the shoulder. Stay here for a second, and then someone taps you out. No, you're yeah. here. Well, <laughs> if you no, want to jump in, you I, I want to respond someone. to Bill's. Uh, I, I really appreciate those types of um, interventions. Just like this is a moment where we're like experimenting. And um, it's not always going to be like the right or perfect thing, right? I think there is no shiny ball, like Derek was saying. And it reminded me of the last workshop I was at again with, uh, I'm going to do it again, Shanasha? Shanasha. Shanasha, Shanasha. <laughs> yeah, Shanasha and Eli um, on, um, on Brownfields, which I'm, gonna, I'm just going to own it, right? Because this is like how I come to shows, uh, right? Because I thought they were talking about Brownfield, like Cloverfield, like it was like a place, but no, they're talking about like Brownfields, like, you know, polluted places, it's a thing. And so I was interested, because I went to the workshop because um, they were talking about it in the context of like community benefits, uh, which is some, sometimes, you know, it's a thing we sometimes try to collectively negotiate as uh, an economic relationship that's kind of like a community-driven version of collective bargaining, right? Uh, and and I was interested because, like in this in in the theory they were testing, they were talking about uh, with public funds going towards the cleanup of some of these polluted sites, these polluted brownfields. Uh, like, what would shared ownership look like? Which I'm always excited about. I mean, you heard about me and Monopoly, but you know, it also comes with like shared liabilities, right? Which is like a thing. And so like one of the questions was how to how to get the value, right, to to the community. How does the community gain value from that transaction regardless of ownership? And one of the last things I feel like we were talking about, if I remember correctly, was like uh, this experiment all in the again, all in the space of just like testing stuff, some of which could fail, right? But you know, what would it look like uh, to to really go to these owners of these developers where we're putting public money to clean up these brown fields to, to you know, in the spirit of what, not even asking, but to say, we're gonna put this money in, but it's an investment. We have to get a return on that investment. You know, for the next period, we have to get the, not only the amount, not only the amount we put in, but as this clearly is gonna be more profitable, we have to get like some return on that for the next few years. And then that money doesn't just go back to the town or to the county or whatever, but like it's a fund that that community gets to have a, a community board that gets to govern, right? To me, that gets that gets all of my like spidey. So I'm excited, right? I was like, we get the community governance, and then we get to put that money back into our shit, you know, our schools or whatever. Developers are actually developers aren't all developers are not all extractive. There's a lot of them that really care. Yeah, but I don't even care if they care or not. The money still, I get to control. I mean, you can hang out with us, you can watch from the sidelines. I mean, you know, but either way, we get the money, it's our investment, right? So, like, that's the kind of stuff that, that we were talking about in that workshop that I found really inspiring. These are the types of experiments that could be happening, that we could be testing, that could, you know, so that the next time, you know, Ford or GM needs a bailout. We could be making these types of demands that go far beyond just say we own the piece, but like actually 
No, we, we govern a piece of the money. Yeah. As a, and as a reminder on format, don't hesitate if you want to jump in. You can tap anyone. And you can tap anyone. Unless, unless someone, Especially Derek. Unless, <laughs> unless <laughs> someone is speaking, but don't tap me out. My ego can't handle it. Oh no, because I'm facilitating. So please, anyone else that wants to go in. <laughs> Julie. Yeah, I didn't want to choose. It feels like too much pressure. Um, so on the topic of compression points, um, whatever that means, I wasn't even in that conversation. So now I'm going to make up the definition of like, yeah, I think that's happening that has big implications maybe is what it means. I don't know. Uh, one thing that I haven't heard mentioned uh, in this room yet is uh, the historic uh, wealth transfer that is happening in the US and around the world. Um, 10 trillion in assets are going to be transferred from essentially aging baby boomers to their children. Um, and that's, that's like a huge opportunity potentially. Um, in my work, I look in particular at uh, businesses that are owned by folks who are retiring and are going to be looking at selling those businesses. Um, it's upwards of 2 million businesses employing millions and millions of people. And uh, there's, a, there's a for real opportunity to suddenly think about instead of those businesses being further consolidated, further building corporate power, actually having them transition to shared ownership models, to cooperatives and to, to other models. So I just wanted to add that as, a, you know, as we think about these predictable emergencies, um, things that are happening that maybe we could organize for. And right now, you know, there's tons of great examples of, of cooperative businesses, but they are grossly undercapitalized. Um, and there's there's a lot of, I think, connections to like the labor movement that can be strengthened, to yeah, the economic justice movement, um, and, to, and to others to, to build that um, opportunity. Perhaps part of the problem with that transfer is just how concentrated that wealth is. So it'll transfer, but to a select few, uh, some good news is that it seems generationally younger generations amongst the wealthy and less wealthy have a different attitude. They have, they have a different political sentiment where they may be uh, open to paradigm change and redefining what is the purpose of an economy and addressing climate change and various other way, things that other generations weren't. And of course, there's a the concern that is this generational or is this life cycle? That as they age, they start to adopt some of the norms. But I think it's generational. I, I think there were a set of conditions by which they came up during that's been different from other generations that very well presents an opportunity for a shift in politics. And then here's the other positive story. At the end of the day, the most powerful entity, especially in a place like the United States where they have a, their sovereign monetary entity is the state. So uh, regardless of how wealth is distributed at this point in time, having monetary power, the capacities to dictate resources by use of that monetary power is a tremendous thing that uh, we together, if we're able to capture and define what it is we want and capture our government, uh, can do tremendous things. Folks, don't be shy. None of you were shy yesterday, so I'm feeling <laughs> more surprised. Great. So I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to all of you um, and the examples that you brought. So my, my question is really, what is the difference between achieving change, which is very often very hard and you battle for it for a long time, you have to find the right moment, scaling that change, so making sure that there are many more of these things happening, and transformative change. When can we, you know, not only things that we, we're using the niches that we have to do something different, but what are the kind of seeds that we're sowing for, for potential transformative change? And it's almost impossible to answer that question, because we usually <laughs> don't know how you know, hindsight whether it was transformative. But I'm just wondering how you think about those issues as you, you know, try to pursue the change that you pursue. That's a multiple choice answer yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> We have history as examples of, of what were the conditions and have we had transformative change and what were the conditions when that transformative change took place? I think there are many inflection points. Uh, 
Hell, the current paradigm that we in, they were in was a transformative change. Uh, in the 1970s, we ushered in uh, this hyper focus on a notion of property rights and a perceived characterization of markets as the mechanism of distribution. I think it was reactionary to what happened after World War II. I think after World War II, with things like the Declaration of, of Human Rights, uh, I think we had a, a whole shift in society. I don't think it was inclusive. I think we excluded the Global South. I think the United States, a lot of people of color, uh, black and indigenous people in particular were left out. Uh, but it was remarkable, I think. That, that it, I think it was transformative. Uh, we had political rights, we had civil rights, social rights, cultural rights, these are all the elements that they named in that UN Declaration. And we had economic rights. We, we did universal health care in many places. Uh, again, we did them in inadequate ways. Um, even today, we don't contest political rights as something that should be given. We're in it. We don't fully give political rights, that's clear. We don't fully give civil rights, but in Nomenclature, enlightened people will argue that civil rights are something that people should have. I think the economic rights and the purpose of why we're here in this, this convening, uh, that's the one that's been the contested space. That, and that, that to me has been the co-optation. That somehow a belief that governments have a fiduciary to ensure people have health care, people have a job, people have capital, people have a basic income, that that being a contested space is the co-optation of freedom and justice. That that is the element by which, you know, if you're rationing your access to health care, if you're rationing your access to a job based on a price mechanism, who has access, quality, and quantity, that's not free. That, that is when people are vulnerable uh, and don't have agency in their lives. So I don't have the, uh, I don't know if you love the building. How do we do? So like, throw them off the kilter. Um, no, I don't have enough degrees to know if I agree or disagree with Derek at the moment. <laughs> so so me, but I am going to say something. I'm just going to say it. I don't like the rights-based framework at all. I don't think it's transformative. I think it says backwards, to be honest. And, and I'm a Gen Xer, but I'm a late Gen Xer, so maybe it's my own triggers with that generation. But um, in the spirit of talking about what's transformational, at a conference about property as a framework, uh, I'm going to say that because I think so, so what you should know about me, even though I live in New Jersey, I'm originally from North Carolina. I am Southern through and through um, on all sides of the family. And the majority of black people as of the last census based in the South. And I think that when I talk to my people about the promise of freedom, it goes way further back than the civil rights movement. It goes further back than the New Deal. It, it's kind of back to that, you know, like that Reconstruction era of, of when you think about the Reconstruction amendments of the Constitution. So that they start first with the labor amendment, the 13th Amendment, which abolished forced labor and servitude, and the 14th, which started to define citizenship, and the 15th, which started to define the political rights of suffrage and voting, right? And so, like, if you think about those as like the fundamental ideas behind freedom and behind democracy. That that is like what it would mean to be transformed into a democracy. It's like a collective process. It's not so much about individual rights. It's about governing together. And in order to govern together, then you have to like see ourselves as whole people. You have to see society as a place where every aspect of it is a place where we should be governing together. From workplaces to our neighborhoods and apartment buildings to whatever, right? And so, um, in some ways, in this question that you're asking about how do we think about or know something is transformational, 
And again, I don't even know if I disagree. This could be very much aligned with what you're saying. Uh, I just have a little visceral reaction to the right space framework. It's okay. It's just my thing. Uh, but I think in some ways, like sometimes the thing that is transformative and scalable is a small victory that then gets picked up. Right? It, it could sometimes be that, oh, we realize that if we targeted, for example, the ultimate profiteer instead of just who signs our checks, says a set of 12 precariously employed guest workers, and that worked, and we got out of our bondage, right? This actually happened in Burbridge, Louisiana, at the company of CJC Food Workers, with 12 guest workers in 2012, or 40 guest workers in 2012. And now, like, you know, fast forward in April 2022, you know, thousands of workers in, uh, across uh, South Asia and signed the Tindigal Agreement with the ultimate profiteer. It's right, like all of a sudden, I have scalable victory because you have a scalable strategy, which is different than just saying scalable as in we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people mobilizing for the same thing at the same time. Both can be true and both are scalable, but um, part of what I'm saying is that. Um, uh, transformation can happen in both ways. And so um, I actually agree that we are in a moment right now of transformation due to the need for climate adaptation, due to the crises that were exposed, the kind of like compounding crises that were exposed during the pandemic, and the kind of awakening that happened amongst many workers during the pandemic, both as being defined as essential, both the um, the, the kind of double whammies that happened on people who were historically exploited because of race or because they were already on the edge or whatever. And, uh, and I think that, you know, we talk about, we haven't really mentioned a lot about the federal investments that have gone in for climate adaptation. Like I'm, uh, uh, one of the things that I know I mentioned in one of the workshops yesterday, uh, we've been spending a lot of time in Jobs with Justice trying to figure out how we were supporting workers uh, in the auto industry, and not just the UAW, but throughout that supply chain. Because with the federal investments coming in, and already over the last couple of decades with foreign uh, uh, companies coming in from overseas to build in the South, like the companies are absconding from where they have, say, you know, union contracts and standard setting, and they're all moving with reckless abandon to the US South. Again, where the majority of black people still live, right? And, and even I was reading this book, this uh, from a from a businessman in Japan from like 1983, and I thought he was going to be more nuanced, but uh, no, it, he basically was like, you know, they go to the U.S. South, there be gold there, you know, they're racist, it's going to be great, you know. I was like, oh, he just said it, that's amazing, wow, all right, uh, and so and that was 1983. And now it's happening with our own federal dollars, where these companies to build electric fleets are leaving Wisconsin to build the U.S. Postal Service electric fleet, moving to South Carolina, leaving the U.K. to build UPS's electric fleet, uh, moving to South Carolina, leaving Los Angeles, Proterra, to build electric fleets for many cities, moving to South Carolina, batteries, Georgia, South Carolina. I mean, they're, they're just, they're going to the U.S. South to build these cars. And the idea of being able to, I see, I know, I know. He's about to blow the whistle. He's about to blow the whistle. He's about to blow the whistle, and it's gonna, it's okay. It's okay. I hear it. I hear the whistle blowing. Uh, Johnny Cash. Anyway, uh, so all that is to say that uh, winning some form of governance in an industry like that, whether it's industrial standard setting, supporting collective bargaining agreements that unions are trying to negotiate throughout that industry. Uh, would be transformational for reasons that are different than, say, just winning, even in Detroit or in, right? Because, like, in some ways, that would actually be my, for example, my ancestors' promise for reconstruction more so than just winning a, a contract in New York. So this is, like, some of the things that I use when thinking about criteria for transformation. And the last word goes to a guest. If you could introduce yourself. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> introduce yourself. <laughs> yes, so my name is uh, Joseph Jones, and I'm an um, associate professor of political science at Buckland University. But smiling, but, um, she kind of spoke to it. I want to talk about the South. You know, I, I, I saw a news article this morning where um, the AGC was saying that there are three companies that are holding almost 19,000 um, single land homes. 
Um, and that was just the top three. If you go to the top 10, it's almost like 40,000. So you, you talk about the South, and you talk about how this has become a place where people are coming to try to you know, exploit and, and do these types of things. So I'm just wondering what, and this is a very progressive space. Like I, I was, my mind has been blown about some of the things that are happening here in California, but in the front of my mind is like, how do we, how do I bring this back to the South? Like what can be done? Is there any advice you walk in? I know Darren, you've done some work down in the land. I'd love to hear what, what could we do down here? That sounds like a great open space topic. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, if we just have a round of applause for all of our panelists and everyone who's on this traditional panel. And I do actually think it's, it's going to be a very open space to help it. And with that, I'd love to pivot yes, and transition. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.